ministers to all of God's children. Well, now we're going to start our discussion for this afternoon, and the topic is the effects of second coming expectation. And I don't have anything real elaborate pre prepared here. I've already spoken, so this is your time. I'll just introduce some thoughts, uh, maybe ask a question or two just to stir up your minds. And if, uh, if you have questions, this would be a good time for you to ask questions that are on your mind. And we ask that you do come up to the front uh, and, and stand here so that we can have, have everything on tape. There are people that, that aren't able to be here that would like to hear these things. So please do come up to the front. No cheating and sitting down. You got to come up here and speak. The effects of second coming expectation. Uh, I went to the thesaurus, and by effect, I came up with some good words. The outcome, the result, I like the word force, the force of second coming expectation. The impact, the impression, the consequence, the influence. The Holy Spirit ministers, ministers truth to us to have an intended effect. It's not just for informational purposes. God isn't just filling us with information to make us smart. As, as Brother Seth ministered and others, it's to have an effect. There's a definite purpose for what we are speaking about here today. And there are definite and eternal consequences about what you and I choose to believe. So we want to believe the truth that God's given us. I was very glad when I heard that this was the theme of this renewal, the theme that Brother Gibbon chose, because it's something that's weighed heavy, heavy upon my own heart. It's something that I can't speak for everyone here, but I know myself, I very, very rarely hear any preaching or teaching on the second coming of the Lord. I don't even, very rarely even hear an allusion to it. I mean, it's just not spoken of at all. And this has some very dire consequences. And we can see in a lot of the churches the consequences of this this kind of uh, attitude and belief towards the doctrine of Jesus Christ. I think a lot of preachers and teachers avoid it for the simple reason that they don't really think it's that important. It, it, it's not all that important to speak about it. What's important is that we teach people the commandments of God and how to live holy. That seems to be the main thing nowadays. Not that that's, that's not important at all. Those things are important, but that's not the way the gospel works. And since the people don't hear about it, then consequently the people in the pews don't think it's important either. And I, I believe there's an awful lot of people that think that the doctrine of the coming of the Lord is really inconsequential to the faith. Nothing could be more wrong. That is a, that's a lie sent right from the devil. What we believe about the coming of the Lord has everything to do with our faith, as we've been hearing here the last couple days. And the result that we've seen, of course, that there are multitudes of people who are very comfortable and at ease in this life. That's the result of this kind of thing, this negative thing that I'm talking about. Being at ease in this life, people are immersed into their jobs, their families, their finances. The churches are immersed into trying to modify behavior being busy, having good Christian fun, and consequently are not ready for the end of this present evil world. So by expectation, what I mean is that we have considered and know the consequences of the Lord's return, and we are in hearty agreement with His speedy return. Amen. To say that we are in expectation is to affirm that we are ready. Not that we hope we'll be ready someday. When you're in expectation, it means now. I'm ready now, and I want him to come now. That's what we mean by expectation. Now, we don't want to have a second coming suspicion. We don't want to think, well, you know, I believe the Lord probably could come in my lifetime, but I don't, I don't really think he will, you know, from the signs and things that I've observed. We don't want that. that that's not of God. Even if you think the Lord could come in your lifetime, that's not of God. It's the Lord will come. I want the Lord to come in my lifetime. I'm ready for the Lord to come. <clears throat> the, 
the intended effect of the Holy Spirit is to believe that He is coming and Lord willing today. If you can imagine reading a novel that never ended, I mean, it might be kind of a curiosity to have a book that existed that never had an ending, just page after page after page went on and on. It might be kind of a curiosity to some people, but how pathetically boring. I mean, who would really want to sit down and start reading it? Who would really genuinely be interested in a novel that never ended? Or imagine getting in your car and going on a trip that had no destination, no end. You just drive and drive and drive and drive. Now, if you knew that, you wouldn't even get in the car in the first place. Why bother? Now, that's, the, that's some maybe poor illustrations, but that, those are the illustrations of how important it is to believe that the Lord is coming back. There is an end coming. Can you imagine crucifying the flesh and esteeming others better than yourself, laboring for the kingdom of Christ at your personal expense, worshiping, serving, and praying to a God that you don't think will ever come and that you don't think you'll ever see? How foolish, how ludicrous. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Think of all the things that we are involved in our Christian lives, fighting the good fight of faith. I can tell you I don't fight the good fight of faith because I enjoy a good scrap. <laughs> I'm fighting the good fight of faith because he's coming again. I don't tithe and give offerings because I've just got loads of money I've got to get rid of real quick. It's because I know he's coming. I don't seek the Lord's forgiveness for my sins for one reason or another or just because I think it's a nice thing to do. I want to be forgiven because he's coming again. We suffer with Christ not because we enjoy suffering, because we know he's coming again. As meetings, at meetings such as this, we don't exhort and edify one another because we like to feel good. It's because the Lord is coming again. You think about everything that we do together and the way that we live, everything is because Jesus Christ is coming again. And that should be our mindset. That's the intended effect of the doctrine of the coming of Christ. Amen. It's the truth. Preaching, praying, everything is, is uh, oriented towards the end of this world. Have this word in, in Proverbs, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. You recall... At the time that Christ came into the world, all the people were in expectation as they, they mused about John the Baptist there, whether he would be the Christ or not. Mm -hmm. They were in expectation. I don't think that's just a coincidence that the people were in expectation Amen. at that time. And I, I, we'll get into this some more. I'm sure you have thoughts of your own about uh, expectation. Uh, one more thing here before I open up the floor to you. I wanted to throw in this thing, and uh, I think it was Brother Aaron mentioned this here in Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 and 7. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and the voice of many waters, and the voice of many thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. I, I uh, really enjoy this passage of the scripture. Now, what it is not saying, it is not saying the marriage of the Lamb has come and for his wife is now ready. That's not right. The Lord's not waiting for us to be ready so that he comes, so that he can come. That's not it. Let me read this from Young's literal translation. May we rejoice and exult and give the glory to him because come did the marriage of the Lamb, and his wife did make herself ready. We are ready. We are ready. His wife is ready. That's the point. So I'll, I'll just throw out two or three questions here, and if, um, if the Lord's laid something on your heart, you don't have to answer these questions. This is just to kind of stir up some thoughts. Um, you may want to consider what effect has the expectation of the hope of his return had on you in your life, if, if you want to testify to that. Or what effect has the knowledge that you are ready 
and you are anxiously looking for his return, what, ha what effect has that had in your walk with God? I just had a couple quick uh, things I wanted to say. Um, First of all, I've, I've been preaching on the second coming at Westside this past, past month in Joplin, uh, kind of in prepare, preparation for this uh, renewal this year. And uh, I spoke about this, my personal experience with this truth uh, to Westside, as some of the folks here at Westside have already heard me tell this. But when I was a younger, about 12, um, I was reading, I used to read the scriptures every night, you know, before I went to bed. and. And uh, this particular night, I was reading Matthew 24. And I've always been, you know, someone of faith. It's always at different levels as you grow. But this particular night, I read Matthew 24. And it was the text that's already been alluded to several times by other speakers. It says that, the, uh, that every eye will see him and that the nations will mourn. It's similar to Revelation 1-7. But something happened to me. <laughs> When I read it that night, I can remember that just like it was yesterday. Uh, some of you may have had this experience at one or maybe several times in your life, kind of a when the truth kind of bursts on you. It's kind of like maybe a born-again experience. I don't, I don't know what you might call it exactly. Illumination maybe. But uh, it's, I think maybe it's the truth getting down from your head to your heart. Maybe that's a better explanation. But that kind of happened to me that night. And uh, I remember actually shaking, literally shaking, un almost uncontrollably, at the realization that that text was, at, if I believed that, and I did, that that was actually ultimate reality. Do, do you understand what I mean by ultimate? That this has already been touched on. The things that we see are temporal. That's not really real in this ultimate sense. But Christ coming again, it kind of woke me up to ultimate reality. That was real. And I tell you what, it had an effect up, upon me. I remember Brother Dave in his message, is Jesus safe? You know the reference to the Chronicles of Narnia, is he safe? Well, you know, it, that's, it, it did scare me. It wasn't that I wasn't ready for him, but the, the realization of literally, literally, in my flesh, I shall, I shall see God. That, that realization caused me to shake. <laughs> not, not, necessarily, not necessarily because I was scared, but uh, the, the, it was the uh, reality of the thing. Uh, the second uh, thing I wanted to bring up a little more on not such a personal note was uh, the fact that most of the teaching and preaching I have heard and read uh, does not come from the restoration movement, I'm afraid. There are some, thank the Lord. Most of what I have read in college and, and in some other, other places of study have been written by... Uh, what we call evangelical or fundamentalist circles. That's, they're the ones putting out most of the literature about the second coming. And most of that stuff is, uh, frankly, a lot of it is false teaching. It's false doctrine. It's not true about the second coming. And that's very unfortunate that, that the, the, most of the stuff that is being said and preached and written about the second coming is based upon a, what we call a premillennial system of thought, uh, which is false, it's false doctrine. I don't, I don't have time, obviously, to talk about it in, in depth. But uh, th this term, uh, premillennialism, is a doctrine around which uh, these people actually bend the entire scriptures. It's a very serious thing. You see, the, the second coming of Christ, as Brother Mike was saying, it's, it's not only important, that's an understatement. It's integral to the, your entire understanding of the whole Bible. You, you may not Amen. realize that, but, but uh, if you get off in, in left field somewhere on this particular doctrine, it'll, it'll like permeate through your entire understanding of the entire Bible mm -hmm. and your entire understanding of why Jesus came in the first place and his kingdom. And uh, these people who uh, propagate an earthly, when Jesus comes, they say he's going to set up an earthly millennial kingdom. And they bend a lot of other, uh, other scriptures around this presupposition, which is not a biblical uh, statement of truth. And I, 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 it brought to mind, I won't read it, I'll just quote it for you, but Jesus said to Pilate in John chapter 18, He said, My kingdom 
is not of this world. I was talking to a man who was of a premillennial perspective, and I, I said, one reason, I, one problem I have with your doctrine is that Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. That's what he said the first time he was in the world. Now why would I think that the second time he would come, that his kingdom suddenly would become of this world? That doesn't make sense to me. And this man actually rested the scriptures to support it. He said, oh, now that text doesn't say that it's not of this world. Jesus actually said, my kingdom is not yet of this world. Huh. Now, Brother Seth, I've studied some Greek, and you probably have your Greek New Testament. I don't think that's what the text says. Out of this world. It's, that's right. Jesus Christ, the idea is that Christ's kingdom has, it's not of a worldly order. It wasn't the first time, and folk, it's not going to be the second time. We're to cut all of our connections with this worldly kingdom. The kingdoms of this world have nothing in common at all with the kingdom of Christ. And the, king, the kings that run the kingdom of this world have nothing in common with our king. And so you just need to be aware that most of the stuff that you might hear preached in the church is, is from this perspective of uh, Brother Dave is at a seminary where this is taught. I know he's very familiar with some of these things. And most of what is taught and preached in fundamental circles is from that perspective. And I'm afraid that it, in many ways it has robbed people of their hope. And we're looking for a world to come wherein dwells righteousness. We're not looking for an earthly kingdom to come. I had two things uh, at this point. Uh, tomorrow's lecture that I'll be giving is going to be dealing with some of those issues that Brother Jason has raised uh, there. Uh, whenever you talk about a, an amillennial, postmillennial, or premillennial position, we're going to open up some of those a little bit tomorrow just so people are familiar with the terminology because it is out there. Uh, I want to show some of the history of those views as well. And, and I don't want to take too long on it, but some. Uh, just suffice to say that what Brother Jason has said, people don't come to Revelation 20 and form their view. That's important. They're, they're, the view is a package. How you interpret Old Testament prophecy affects how you come out of Revelation 20. If you interpret the prophecy at a face value literalism, you will be premillennial when you come out of Revelation 20. If you interpret prophecy symbolically, as was done by the apostles, which I'm giving a, a leaning toward where I'm going tomorrow, they interpret, interpreted those things symbolically as well. Then when you come to Revelation 20, you will more than likely wind up with a symbolic view of the millennium or an amillennial view. So it, it's, a, it's a big package. Uh, there's other things that we'll go into tomorrow. On the personal note, uh, as Brother Michael raised the question about what does the expectation of the second coming, what effect has this had? Uh, this had a major effect in my life because it caused me to shift careers. I went from pursuing a, um, a degree that I thought would lead into medical training to become a physician and uh, switched. I was wrestling with the call to ministry at the time and, and I did other things. I, I pursued some other studies for a while and then finally gave up and said, I want to be ready. And the best way that I can be ready is to be being used in the most effective way I can. And for me, it was the pulpit. Now that's not for everybody. I'm not downgrading other occupations. For some people, the most effective use of their time before the Lord comes back will be as a physician, will be as a cobbler, as an auto mechanic, or whatever it is. But for me, I knew that my most effective use of whatever time I had was going to be teaching as many people as I possibly could. And if I'd gone the other route, maybe I'd get to preach every other month, teach a Sunday school on occasion. But as it is now, it was all the time. And um, that had a huge effect on me. If I didn't have a view of the second coming from the Brethren at Independence Hill, emphasizing that doctrine and majoring on it and having it as our hope, um, I would have been content to just go on my way as I had already planned, and really plans I had made as an unbeliever when I was 17, and just follow on that path instead of after uh, coming to Christ at 18, allowing that to shape even career plans. Now many of you brethren are 
in the midst of career. And I want to encourage you, if the Lord is calling you to work in his vineyard directly, full time, no doubt about it, don't back away from that. Some of the best students that I was in Bible college with were not the 18-year-olds, they were the 48-year-olds. Uh, I think of uh, John Bales that sold a car dealership. Uh, he was a very successful man to come to Ozark to get some training. Got his emergency medical technician training and then went down to Haiti to work among the people. Radical shift in the middle of his career shifted. He had a heart to do it and he saw this is what God would have him to do. So don't, don't just dismiss this even if, if, if you're of a mature age. And for you younger brethren, you be listening to see if the Lord says this is what he would have you to do. And you brethren that are around these younger brethren, you watch. If you see men full of talent and promise, don't shuttle them off to the world. We need them in the Amen. pulpit. You see young women that have a quick mind, a grasp of, of scripture and ability, don't throw them out to the world. We need them to work in the Lord's vineyard too. Amen. And that's my commercial. I wrote down some questions while I was preparing this. Um, why do so many desire to go after their own interests and not fight for holiness and victory over the world, the flesh and the devil? Well, it seems too much of a fight. Are we not preaching the coming of the Lord? Are we not uh, preparing people to expect it? The church has so many dropouts, so many has-beens. Our evangelism is not effective enough, but it seems that more than half of all the people we bring into the church drop out soon, uh, losing their goal and their determination to live with it. This tragic multitude of has-been church members and failures is an indication that we're not uh, giving them conviction. So the church ought to give more basis for faith, preach the resurrection of Jesus. But when a church begins to preach prophecy, it gets into confusion and conflict, and that is distracting, and it becomes uh, a, a divisive and, uh, and dis disruptive to people's minds, unsettling, so it gets dropped as a dangerous subject. I think that we need to warn about that. I've seen sometimes, uh, I know one church about 50 years ago in southwest Missouri that had had a modernist preacher and the church even had some elders that hadn't been baptized and Stanley Letcher came in there, uh, wasn't trained in theology, he was a, a fervent man, effective, energetic, I think he'd been a banker and he preached prophecy and he preached largely the premillennial view and uh, the church began, to, he could advertise that, that drew people of curiosity especially Sunday night crowds, and he taught them to give and tithe and support mission work, and, and he just added to the eldership the young men that had been taught scripturally in J.W. Goodman's class. And it turned out, he turned them around. You can't believe that the Lord knew and announced beforehand what's going to happen, then really fulfilled these prophecies without believing the Bible is inspired, see? And he established faith in that congregation. The greatest example I've ever seen, and I've, I've traveled around this country and the world quite a bit, and uh, now I've been preaching 64 years, I've seen very few churches ever turn back from modernism and liberalism and decay. And that church did. And yet, uh, the congregation I was preaching in about seven miles away, twice a month, with some of them going there on the days I wasn't there, uh, I was driving up from Bentonville, Arkansas, the beginning of our little school, to preach there, and they would say, uh, they heard this, what do you think about that? And I said, well, it is speculative, and it's uncertain interpretation, I don't have time for that kind of thing. I need to teach what the Bible makes clear. And they said, we're glad of that, glad you don't preach that, but they wanted to ask me about it. Well, it did turn out pretty well because um, well, I guess his successor just dropped the whole subject. He had an entirely different viewpoint, and, and then Bob Lytle came in or picked up the pieces, and Bob preached the gospel with a great deal of heart and feeling and won the people to Christ and the concern for one another, and the congregation went on. 
I even knew back here in this area here at Lowell, Indiana, Gene Poor still lived between Lowell and Cedar Lake. His father, Jake Poor, used to meet with C.G. Kindred and uh, B.W. Carrier and these men in a study club studying the, the C.I. Schofield Bible system of premillennial dispensationalism uh, and uh, they were very strong on it. And Carrier taught it so strongly. The young men that came to the Cincinnati Bible Seminary in the 30s while I was there were amazed that they, they just could hardly harmonize the leading scholars up here that they trusted with the leading teachers in Cincinnati that they trusted and Sherman Nichols and I was asking about how is this, you know, why can't, well, that's, the Schofield reference Bible is very poor interpretation of many places in its notes and it was very misleading this way. Then along in your generation came Hal Lindsey with five or six books selling millions of copies and getting, and this, the Dallas Theological Seminary in Dallas having about 800 graduate student preachers at a time constantly with its uh, chief emphasis on dispensational premillennialism. Uh, it has spread this, so a group of preachers in southwest Missouri one time said, we want to publish some tracts. We want to arouse the people. So they sent me, the, they asked me by letter if I would consider reviewing their tracts. The first one they sent me was a newspaper on the morning after the rapture. Well, I wrote back and I said, I really want people to believe in Christ and to be stirred up to, to think of the reality of Christ and his second coming. But to choose the one thing that's most uncertain about it to put out first is to be, well, this is very doubtful. And so I wrote them quite a study about the consideration of a secret rapture. Now you can believe in the rapture of the church before the burning up of the earth, but that doesn't mean a secret rapture before the, dis the tribulation and before the thousand years. Since we're coming close to the year 2000, a lot of people will think in terms of millennialism. And some just think that God said, made the earth in seven days or six days and rested the seventh day. But therefore, this is ending 6,000 years of world history and the seventh day will the 7,000 years just have to be the millennium. <clears throat> you know, that sort of thing. People hang things together like that and draw their own confusions without any basis in logic, without a real connection in proof. So that sort of thing. It, it gets people doubting the reliability of any teaching about the second coming. Beware of that. So one of the questions I put down was, are, has the devil so twisted and clouded the truth about the coming victory that we choose to neglect it and then forget it. I've seen congregations that uh, had a lot of emphasis on this, then when it got to be conflicting, divisive, they just drop it and they don't want to hear a sermon on the second coming. Are we so occupied with our efforts at success in this world that we don't want to see the other world? Are we so misled by the psychology of the world and it's false ways of dealing with people's problems that we go for psycho counseling. And uh, I don't want to be too unreliable and disrespectful here, but a great deal of what psycho counselors do, that ought to be two words, psycho and counselor. They're very much on the wrong track. In many, most cases, they're doing more harm than good. And some of them that have practiced it for years have waked up to that. And it's, what's his name? Vitz in New York City, uh, Henry Brandt and others. And our, our country seems to be hung up on mental disease. And uh, had a good book by a good English doctor about the uh, the myth of mental illness. Now some people are rather deranged or in, you know, in a bad place, but generally this is connected with guilt and with a lack of sound teaching of God's grace and the acceptance of the opportunity of repentance and forgiveness. Yes. And some people sort of go through the motions and yet they don't really appropriate forgiveness and lay down their burden in the in the face of the grace of God. 
But the church gets hung up on dealing with people's immediate symptoms or uh, uh, using the methods of the secular psychotherapy, which largely depends upon chemicals. Now there's some schizophrenia that seems to be chemical imbalance in the spinal fluid and in the brain and needs chemical treatment. There are some <coughs> things uh, like epilepsy that are under control pretty well by the medicines that they're getting. It seems like the, the people that have come to me in Joplin since I've been retired are pretty much of this kind. They got one and then their friends and their friends and they've mostly been through the Ozark Center, which is a psychologist, psychomedicine part of Joplin. And so this has been, I've been very close to it in the last four years. And at least one case of very obviously demon possession. And we prayed and this person accepted the prayers and the Lord's word and refused the medicines and went through it and, and really got deliverance. And uh, we, start to preach the second coming enthusiastically and people read the books like he says and then there is so much confusion about what is the truth they're applying Matthew 24 where it doesn't apply and uh, bringing in a lot of Daniel and, and making up wild assumptions to put in there and it, they can't really be defended by someone who makes a careful analysis so uh, you can have a time when there's overemphasis, uh, other or emphasis of the wrong kind, and then it will be defamed and, and be uh, become distasteful or ineffective. Yet the New Testament is full of it. You've seen we've put a lot of New Testament, and we haven't used the Book of Hebrews, the third and fourth chapters. We haven't used uh, <coughs> the First Corinthians 10, 1 to 12, yes. and passages of some length that bear on this subject. Just preach through the New Testament without being too picky to develop every word, which makes some good expository sermons, but preach broadly. Preach through a book in four or five weeks and get the people to read the book and expect what to preach and just preach through the New Testament and they'll begin to think the New Testament makes sense and learn what it does say. Well, that's in the line of what I want to suggest. I like a little the hymn we sing, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, and faultless to stand before his throne. Amen. Preach it in the terms of faith and personal relationship with Christ and uh, the holiness of Christ in the Holy Spirit in us. Uh, I want to use Romans 15, 13. May the God of peace fill you with all joy and the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now remember that. Memorize different versions, use a different order there. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. That is overflow. They use the word for overflow. That's what abound refers to in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The books of the New Testament are full of it. If you are full of it in your heart, but preach what is true and undeniable, don't go into the speculation about the ninth chapter of Daniel and the 69 weeks being separated from the 70th week and the, week, uh, the 70th week coming up at the rapture and becoming a seven years of Jewish domination, the Lord returning to the Jews. Jews, it was mentioned here, Jews were not cast out. No, if they want to believe in Christ. But if they don't believe in Christ, they're cut off by that unbelief. Very definitely, that is, Romans 11 says so. But uh, to say that God still must make the Jews his people in some special way is to deny Ephesians 2. God made of the two one new man in Christ. God has only one people, the people of Christ. He doesn't have a Jewish people for a worldly plan of a vic uh, kingdom and a non-Jewish people for another plan. He has one salvation, he has one kingdom, he has one family, and we're all of the same family. Study Ephesians over and over. You have to read it all the way through every day for a month. You'll begin to get enlightened. Uh, 
This little poem meant something to me, my you. If he should come today and find my hands so full of future plans, what a how fair, in which my Savior has no share, what would he say? If he should come today and find my love so cold, my face so very weak and dim, I had not even looked for him, what would he say? If he should come today, would I be glad, quite glad, altogether glad, the idea, remembering he had died for all, and none through me had heard his call. What would I say? What would I say? Um, this is very stimulating. It is very important that we remember whose we are and who we are and what we're going for in this world. And don't lose your way because there are all sorts of voices and directions and signs going every direction. You believe Christ. I invite you to pray. What you know is true by the, the gospel testimony is reliable and confirmable. The Lord arose from the dead. Pray to the Lord. I know it's true. Help me to believe it and be a believer. I didn't come with notes, so I hope that I can organize my thoughts here real quick. I think due to an influx of NutraSweet, I found out this causes your mind to drift. So stay away from that. But Brother Michael, regarding what the uh, coming of the Lord has uh, changes made in my life. Uh, first of all, I want to say I praise God for uh, the minds that He has given some of you. They're able to collect and retain the Scripture and put them together and, and see how they fit interlocking. Uh, it, it impresses me and encourages me. And I, I can't pretend to be somebody I'm not. Dave, what was that word that Missourians taught you? The willies. The willies. I want to teach you another one so that I didn't leave your presence having not taught you anything. I, Brother Jason, I, I am um, somewhat intimidated sometimes by some of these people who propagate uh, premillennialism, especially dispensational premillennialism. And I don't know all the ins and outs, I know some of them. But they're boneheads. That's just the word, that's your word, they're boneheads. Okay, you gotta think about that because it just doesn't make sense. But when I look at their big TV programs and I think about the things that they're doing and I realize that I think they're trying to serve the Lord, there's no doubt. And I think, what am I ever going to do? I don't have their drawing. But I was raised, instructed by a preacher, a very intelligent man and a great personal evangelist. And he just always reminded us that no matter where we're at, we put the hook in the water. You know, we're fishers of men. See, not only is it imperative that I am prepared for the coming of the Lord, but who's going to be there with me? You know, am I going to say, here I am, Lord. Is he going to say, who's there with you? I think he is. He's going to want to know. And I, I'm not uh, a great evangelist of our time. They're just about all died out, I think. But there have been occasions that God has allowed me to speak to people. And just over the last 20 years, various people, of different status. And there was one woman who I spoke to and shared the gospel with him. Brother Gibbon was with me that night and I wish you could have been there because he entertained a man who was playing a harmonica while I spoke to his dying wife about Christ. Now that seemed a little reversed, didn't it? That's how God planned it and I baptized her into Christ and she died three months later but she brought 300 people one day to hear me preach the gospel. You know what she did? She died. And there are people that, that God has led into my path where I've just simply dropped the hook in the water and told them like I did the police officer Dave last week that everything is laid bare before God in whom you will have to give account. And suddenly he comes under the conviction and I have to account for my life. But then I think of somebody like that nobody else would have thought of and I didn't think of him, a young man who I met in a drug rehab unit 
who is, uh, I'm undereducated and he only has a freshman in high school education. And yet, when he heard the good news of Jesus, he has now conducted two revivals in a maximum security penitentiary in Mexico City. And so when you look at, at the people who seem to be speaking to the masses and getting the information and misconstrued as it is about the second coming of Christ, just remember, just keep the hook in the water. I mean, God may use you like to speak to thousands of people at one time and He may only use you to speak to one. But that person may be the one who brings the others. And so the, the conviction that Christ is coming and coming soon, simply put to me, just causes me to put the hook in the water. Give them something because they will come. I mean, I, I love to talk about the second coming and I have more books in my library than I will ever read regarding this subject. But even if I read them and understand them, as I told a woman one day, I said, it'll do me no good if I don't tell somebody else that they need to be ready. And so I want to encourage you to do that when you leave here. By the time you leave here, even while you're here this week, tell somebody that the Lord is coming that doesn't know that. That's what I had to say. In the year 1956, uh, it was a, was a epoch in my life when a very major shift in my career took place. And uh, it was actually a time of spiritual devastation. I, I recouped from it and I actually saw God's hand in it. But uh, that began a period of a 30 year isolation from the religious community official and total excommunication and it just about broke me broke me in two but I, I just uh, found a group of people and we just started preaching and one night uh, I was reading a book called The Flood written by Ray Winkle it's an apologetic very excellent book and uh, one section of this book he, uh, he parallels the flood with the coming of the Lord and I knew these texts from, uh, from a child. I knew these texts and I read this and the reality of Christ's coming just sort of it burst on my soul. And at first it was, it frightened me. And I suddenly realized that every, everything that's seen is going to pass away and he'd painted a vivid picture, you know, paralleling it with the uh, temporal uh, cataclysmic events that had all volcanic eruptions and the flood itself and and it was a, a shaking experience it shook my flesh down to the core and uh, that evening I couldn't sleep and that evening I pondered this and I realized that salvation was delivered you know, that salvation was tailored to ready you for that time that's that's what it uh, that's one of the chief benefits is he delivered us from the wrath to come and it had a uh, it it had such an impact on my personal life that I became willing to live in isolation if necessary. Now God graciously did I was I didn't have to, and I, for which I give thanks that I didn't have to be a, a loner. But but I was willing to, if necessary. I was I would not compromise my faith. I would not violate my conscience. I would not do something that did not ready me for the coming of the Lord. A career meant you know nothing to me anymore at all and it had that significant impact on on my uh, life something that uh, when I was just a young boy that was I was counseled by I don't even know who told me this but it was someone at a camp or something there were things when you were uh, 10 11 12 13 in there that the Bible really didn't say anything about and people would ask you know should you smoke should you chew tobacco should you play cards how about movies you know and there were all kind of things like that that you should you go to the sock hop dance after the football game and you know 
I didn't have answers to that, but I, want, but I wanted to, and this person counseled me. He said, now, you just ask yourself the question, is this where I want to be when Jesus comes? <laughs> I never asked myself that question that I didn't know the answer. It's, it's, it's kind of come across to you that the, the new creation that you have in Christ Jesus is susceptible to the truth of God. And you cannot ask yourself that question and say, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know whether I should, uh, should do this or not. It just kind of becomes intuitive to you that there's something in a child of God that can, tells them there are things that aren't harmonious with the coming of the Lord. That, uh, yeah, some things that just like uh, uh, Jael took a nail and nailed Sisera's head to the earth. <laughs> you remember in the book of Judges, gruesome account. There are forms of entertainment, forms of living, forms of business, forms of human relations that nail your head to the earth. You just nail it down to this world. And uh, the, a good knowledge of the, and conviction, maybe is a better word, of the conviction of the coming of the Lord will get your head off the earth. It'll get you unpinned, and that's the secret to victory. This is your, this is your victory. It's your faith. See, your, your faith is the victory overcomes the world, and the coming of the Lord, the fact that he's coming, is gonna, and it's going to be the grand terminus to everything that uh, is inhibited, Anything that inhibits, restrains, anything that makes it difficult, all that's going to end when you're convicted of that in your heart, you're not going to get, take hold of the, th of the thing that's hindering you. See, the thing that's hurting you and harming you, you'll hold it lightly, like uh, Abraham and Job, such noble examples for us all, and they didn't have access to the information we have access to at least not to the level that not to the level that we do but both of them were wealthy men very wealthy men but they held it lightly in fact a job we don't have any record of him lamenting because he lost everything like that he just he could let it let it go now if and if abraham and job in those spiritually primitive times could have the world and yet use it and not abuse it, as the First Corinthians 7.19 says, then how much more us who have the promise of the coming of the Lord when not only is he going to take away everything that's inhibited, he's going to bring everything, everything that is complementary to our salvation. He's going to bring it, bring it with him so that all the advantages are going to be brought with him. See, the understanding of this enables you to survive in this world. Uh, from 1992 to 1995, I held 40 revival meetings and preached in 130 different churches. And every church I went to, there was a question I asked. I said, has anyone here ever heard a sermon on the second coming of Christ? I never had an affirmative answer. One time, an older couple collared me after and said, we remember long time, long time back we heard about the second coming of Christ. But in those 130 churches, no, and most of them were like younger churches, none of them had ever heard from their pulpit a sermon on the second coming of Christ. It's astounding, and uh, I think it's the it answers kind of the condition, the spiritual conditions that are around us, and it all can be resolved by determination, just among us, determination. I'm not going to let that happen. If, if I've got a church where people aren't preaching on the second coming, make them do it. Amen. Say we would, you can leave or do it. You serve the notice on them. If you don't know much about it, just get up and read the Bible about it. We'll figure it out from there. But the consciousness of the people must be raised because I can tell you from personal experience, it, it provides an incentive you can't get any other way. Amen. I think the words of the Apostle Peter are very appropriate at this time. 
It blesses me how the apostles, from time to time, they'll get to talking about the truth and they just burst forth in these great expressions of praise because it's dawned on their soul and they've really seen what the Lord is doing and has done. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a lively or living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time wherein ye greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Amen. Amen. One of the, one of the things I think that the devil would like us to forget is that anything we love more than Jesus, we're going to lose. Amen. That's right. We're not going to keep it anyway. There's no point in setting your affection on it. And it, everybody <laughs> that's spoken, I, I think we've all had some kind of um, a realization in our own souls where the Lord spoke to us in ways that were both personal and universal. And for me, it was the realization of standing before the judgment seat. Whenever, I didn't want to do that. There's going to come a split second in time which will seem like eternity. When you're going to be waiting for the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of thy Lord. Or you're going to be waiting to hear, depart from me, ye wicked, I never knew you. Now I can tell you right now, at that point, you can think of the world from the time God created it to the time you left it. And there won't be anything that you wouldn't be willing to give to hear the well done. Nothing. Amen. Amen. Nothing. So we have to have sobriety and presence of mind now to think in those terms. And it's faith mm -hmm. that'll cause you to jump ahead to that time. That we, and it's an appointment. It's an appointment. We're all going to be there one day. And we're all going to answer for ourselves. I like to tell some of the ladies, because we, they've been subjected to some teachings sometimes, it kind of makes them comfortable in slothfulness no matter how well given preaches on the day of judgment, I'm not gonna stand there and go, I'm with him. Amen. I'm either gonna be with Christ or I'm gonna be alone. And that's the way all of us are gonna be presented to the judgment. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be with Christ or alone. Amen. So just a, it, it's a sobering thought, but it's a, it's a thought full of hope too. <laughs> Because at, think about, I think about the victory of Christ, the second coming, how it, it actually proclaims the victory that Christ accomplished. Mm -hmm. He's coming back. The world is defeated. Satan is no longer a foe to be feared. He's one to be wary of. You, you don't want to be slothful. You don't want to be... Um, you, you just don't want to not take it seriously. He's out to kill you. He's lethal. He still is ready to deceive you anytime you let your guard down. And he has power, but it's not unlimited power. Mm -hmm. And it isn't power that can overcome you as long as you're in Christ. We in Christ are victorious. We are victorious mm -hmm. because it's his victory we're resting in. Amen. Uh, just a few thoughts here of things that people made me think of through the day. This one on stewardship and uh, the brother who referenced the talents, how God gave, and whenever the master, or the master gave, and when he came back, he, was, he reckoned with his servants. And that's really a picture of God. Everything we have is from his hand. 
what you are, what your abilities are, the resources you hold, everything is given to you. Mm -hmm. And it's a stewardship. And we're created in his image, and part of that image is this ability to take those stewardships and do something with it. Now he's meted it out as it pleases him. And now your stewardship and my stewardship, all of us, is to develop that to the capacity that God has allowed us to have, and then to hand it back to him. See, we've exercised our, the image of God in us. We've glorified him, and, and we've, uh, we've acknowledged that we've received it as his hand. Then what does he do? He turns around, and he gives us more. He rewards us for being faithful, because it's the nature of our God to be generous and good to those he loves. Amen. In this manner, the image of Christ, the church, as we're transformed into the image of Christ, it's like a mirror of deity. God has shown himself in the face of the sun, and as we're transformed, we reflect that image back. I think of Enoch, who walked with God, and one day he wasn't. God took him. Well, we're hastening the day of the Lord because as we are the image of Christ becomes sharper and clearer in us, then we're more attractive to God because mm -hmm. he's altogether lovely. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to hastening the day. Of, I, I, God, you know, we have emotion because God has emotion. We reflect God. He doesn't reflect us. We're, we're not superimposing our, our humanity on God by by saying that God has strong desires and he desires and purposes that we be in the image of his son. Mm -hmm. Amen. And we have an expected end. I like that. Everyone's got an end, but we have an expected end, one that the Lord has, has told us about and will not be ashamed. I love that, Sister Julia says, hope maketh not ashamed. Well, amen. You can be ashamed, you can be embarrassed, ashamed, you can fail of your goal being ashamed, none of those things. In fact, if anything, we haven't thought large enough about the coming of Christ again and the things that he has for those Amen. that believe him. Amen. Then the brethren that, that uh, referenced the resurrection of Jesus, how that he appeared only to the brethren. Yeah. You see, he's given the world everything that he's going to give them. He's, if anybody's going to, as far as understanding uh, revelation into his word, fellowship, those things are all for those who have believed the record. Mm -hmm. The rest of them are kind of like those brothers that have to go back to Moses and the prophets and hear them first. Because mm -hmm. he said all he's going to say until they've heard what he's already talked to them about. And then I love this, this reference, and you'll, if you'll just um, bear with me. A little holy imagination here when Jesus was go ascending back up into glory to the Father. You know, he came down. What Before then, he was the Word. He was with God. He was God. He was the Word. And when he came for the putting away of sin, he, he's different. When he went back, he was different than when he first came. So I, I think of him as, he, as he's going back up into glory. And there's this chorus going on in heaven. And they're, they're coming along with him and they said, Open up, ye gates, and the King of glory will come in. And the chorus from heaven, who is this king of glory? This is the Lord, the Lord God. And it's, see, they wanted to know. And when he, when he entered in, when those doors opened for him, he left them unlocked for us. John said, he says, and a door was opened in heaven. And so I praise God for that. There's, there's the welcome from heaven. The door is open. And we may enter in through Christ. And I praise his name. And this expectation of his coming again will, the, you talk about how it affects you, purity, being zealous for purity. Yes. Amen. You see the world for what it is. And it's not hard to leave it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. When a preacher takes his watch off, you're in trouble. I want 60 seconds of your time. 
Joan and I came here with great expectation and we have not been disappointed. We have been filled to overflowing. We see many earthen vessels filled with treasure. I expected great things from Wilbur Fields, Seth Wilson, and Given, whom I have read of and known personally for many years. But little did I expect the joy in my soul when the teenage girl got up and said, I sit through the agony of an awards program, but I have awards in my church and in my family and in my Bible. And if we will keep putting young people like that before their peers, Oh, how our expectations will be multiplied in the young man who listened and wrote his poem. Yes. And I thank you both. My expectations have been filled. Hello, brethren. Well, um, Brother Jason said uh, sometimes the scriptures really come out to you when you read them. Well, I'd read the book of Esther before and I didn't see it like I see it now. <laughs> well, there's a lot more in there than just the lesson. Uh, in the lesson of Esther, Mordecai was first considered just a lowly Jew in captivity. He was hated by those who were higher up but the Lord changed all that in the end. In the end, he received the king's crown and robe and ring and was related to the king by the marriage of Esther to the king. Well, we're going to be related to the king, and we are. If we have received Christ, we've been born again into newness of life, we're already related to the king. Mm -hmm. And we've already joined the kingdom mm -hmm. and those which were not the king's people in the lesson became the king's people mm -hmm. and we're going to be and we already are the king's people but we'll have eternal life forever in the eternal kingdom um, Esther was like the bride preparing herself for the bridegroom and she had 12 months to prepare herself before she walked before the king and she was a chosen bride mm -hmm. and we are going to be the bridegroom's chosen bride yes. in glory mm -hmm. and like I said those that were not his people shall be his people and we see that in Christ because the Lord has made a way that if anyone will accept him they shall be his people. Haman was like the devil but he lost out in the end. He was the troublemaker. He was the destroyer but he was destroyed and in the end the devil will be destroyed and the Lord has already put him down mm -hmm. and made him weak. Mm -hmm. We have power in God and in Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. The king told the Jews to fight for themselves, fight for their freedom when he saw the truth. Of course, the Lord is full of truth and he's given us the spirit and we can take the kingdom by violence. The violent take it by force. Mm -hmm. Because of the spirit which he has given us and eternal life. We can bring more in and there will be many mm -hmm. in the kingdom. Amen. And when they passed the messages out to the, to the kingdom, 
for them to, uh, to the provinces, for them to protect themselves. That's like sending the message, come to salvation. Jesus is on our side. The king of, of all kings wants you to have life and be in his kingdom. Amen. And when the book, there was a book of Chronicles that was opened. And that's when the king found out that um, Mordecai had helped him. Mm. Well, there's a book of judgment that's going to be opened. And then the Lord's going to reveal our works. And we want our works to be in his favor. Mm -hmm. Amen. I thank the Lord for that. Amen. 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 I think of... Um, the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Will I find faith when I return? <clears throat> he is able of stones to raise up children. But he said, I will take away your stony heart and give you one that's soft and pliable, mm. one that I can work in, reveal myself in, and reveal you to others so that you look and talk and act like me. Mm -hmm. Now, if our young people here, and they are, they are learning much at the foot of our Lord. And if they continue to minister as they have, then we will still grieve for those who go to their many colleges. And I have nothing against that, but it's what they're being taught and what they embrace. And it's not going to nourish and feed those that sit under that. These meetings are important to me because of that. They stand and minister to my faith, and I'm strengthened and, and nourished by that. I'm thankful that we have such a place of meeting because you're not allowed to stand in many places or even voice uh, something that you know from scripture even in a Bible class. I, I know in myself that the cares of the day is my great robber. I'm too busy to really be bothered by many things that would throw me away, I say. But the cares of the day has thrown me away more than I would admit. But by the grace of God, our brother said yesterday, there's recovery. Amen. Is this legal to go twice? I, I wanted to say a quick word. Sister Becky was talking about young people, and I, I was just flipping through my Bible before she got up, but uh, a lady came up to me, at, well, it was Dave's mom, that came up to me in the lunch line, and, she said, well, how old are you anyway? And I said, well, why? <laughs> she said, well, there's a discussion going on. And then she asked Ada how, how old Ada was and, and Aaron, how old Aaron was. Well, I'm, I'm 21, in case you were wondering. Ada, Aaron's 19, just turned 19. And there's some young people here. And let me just talk to you for a second here and myself. But there, there are some special challenges for, for, for being young. And... All of you know what I'm talking about, even if you're not young, because you were young at one point. Most of you were young at one point. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. But um, here's, here's what Paul told Timothy. Timothy was a young man, a young minister of the gospel. And I, 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 like, to just read the, I, I like to read the book of 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, what we call the pastoral epistles. I like, to, I like to read them quite often because it helps me, because I like to put myself in their place. And I pretend like Paul's writing to me, because basically it is. And here's what he says to Timothy. He says, but you, man of God, flee. 
Here's some things you should flee from. It's speaking to a young person. Flee from all this. He's taught, earlier he's talking about the love of money and carnal desires. And pursue. So you, you got some things you need to flee from as a young person. Some things you need to pursue. Pursue righteousness, godless, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were called. Now that's come to my attention. Being this, this is going to be my fourth year at Ozark Christian College in Joplin. Hardly seems possible. But uh, I don't know, Wilbur and Brother Wilbur, you're still in the in the saddle at Ozark, and I think both of you would would say it's true. But and some of you may not know this, but the students that you taught, Brother Seth are not the same kind of students that I have sitting, and I'm not exalting myself here, are not the same kind of students that are sitting in the desk at, at Ozark Christian College today. And I, I, I fear, and I, I, don't, I don't want to exalt myself and make myself look good because I don't look good. If any of you knew me very well, I have the same problems that any other young person uh, might have. But in, in my estimation, and I, I think the other Bible colleges are similar to Ozark. We, in many ways, are wasting a whole generation of yes. young people. Yes. What, is, what is the psychologists, and I don't like to, to go with the psychologists. I agree with what Brother Seth was saying. Most of them are just witch doctors. But uh, the, psy the psychologists call my generation, 25 and, and younger, they call it Generation X. Maybe you've heard of this terminology. There's a reason for that. <laughs> There's a reason why you call this whole generation Generation, generation X. Because you look across the landscape of my generation, it's a, it's, like a, it's a wasteland, people. It is a wasteland. Spiritually, uh, sociologically, uh, however you want to slice it and dice it, my whole generation is going down in flames right now. And uh, now there is a remnant. But uh, let me tell you, uh, some other brother or sister, I can't remember who it was, that said... Uh, you know, he was concerned about when we're getting older and what about the people come up from behind us. Well, I think God is going to take care of that. But, but uh, I, I just want to be somebody who as much as I can at Ozark and wherever I preach and wherever I go to try to raise a standard a little bit. You know, I get teased at Ozark because I wear suits and ties. You know, why the other people walk around in bell bottoms and boots and stuff, you know. But I'm trying to raise a standard and uh, in any way that I can. And uh, there is young people... You may not know it, but you have a great uh, capacity uh, for God and a lot of abilities that you can use, not because you're wonderful, <laughs> uh, not only because you're young either, but because you are made in the image of God. And you, can, uh, you do not have to waste your youth. That's, right. That's basically what I wanted to say right there. You do not have to waste your youth running after uh, the opposite sex or... Uh, a degree in college, all those, all those things may come, or a career, or any of those things. Because if you ask, I, I, I challenge you to go around and ask some of these older folks about what they might have done when they were your age. And I guarantee you there are a lot of them that regret, that have regrets, some serious regrets about what they did with their lives when they were 15, 16, 17, 20, 21. They, did, they were living in the world instead of serving God, and they had to like make up for it later. And it gets harder. <laughs> the older you get, the harder it gets to, to you know, get yourself in line and discipline yourself and that sort of thing. And I've told this, I've spoken to youth before about this. And I've used this illustration. If you, if, when you button your shirt in the morning, if you get one of these buttons down here off, when you start buttoning that shirt, by the time you get up here, your, your shirt's going to be all out of line. That's kind of the way your life is when you're young. You have the opportunity now to start planting seeds and to start preparing, buttoning your shirt the right way now so that when you end your life up here, you're in line. See? And Solomon said, let me serve the Lord's in the days of my youth before I get old and I'm not able to do the things that I wanted to do when I was young. So don't, so don't waste your youth on silly things please. You have a stewardship from the Lord, um, young or old. If the Lord came tomorrow, it doesn't make a difference. You're 15 or 50. Or we're all going to stand for the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Whether you had 15 years to do your deeds in the body or 50 years, you're still going to give an account. Amen. Amen. 
I didn't think that was. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the result. Um, it's been a while back, a couple months ago, I guess, and um, I was um, sitting in my room and I was thinking about all the unaccomplishments that we have in this life, you know. And, and if I start to cry, I'm just going to sit down. <laughs> but I, I was thinking about how we, I never really get where I want to get, you know. I, I have great aspirations for the Lord, but it never seems to, I don't never seem to be completely satisfied with that aspiration. So I was, I was sitting there thinking about all the unfinished aspirations. You know, it, that's a mistake that we make by looking at ourselves too much. We need to look at Him more. Because see, He never fails. He, he needs all his aspirations. So I was, I, I thought, well, I'm going to comfort myself in John. You know, people are all different. Peter's one way, John's another, Paul's another. And in the church, and I'm talking about the body of Christ, we've got some Pauls, and we've got some Peters, and we've got some Johns, and, and, um, and they all want to be like Jesus. They're just a little different personality. And I um, thought, Lord, if I could be like any of them, I want to be like John. And in this life. So I was reading and I come across this verse and it said, Beloved. Oh, beloved, that's a nice term. Isn't that a nice Amen. term? Every, doesn't everybody want to be beloved to somebody? Yes. Well, God wants to be beloved to us too. And, and he is our beloved. And, and we want to be beloved to somebody. And if I could only have a choice, I'd rather be beloved to him than anybody else. Everything else is passing away. He said, no, no, beloved, no, are we not the sons of God? And brother, um, brother Dave, he just so amply magnified this, this whole text. And I thoroughly enjoyed that because this is a text that means so much to me. In fact, I, I called um, the Sister June. I was going to share this with her, and she wasn't home. Brother Given answered. I thought, oh, well, he knows all about this, but I'm going to share it with him anyway. So the, I read this text over and over. Said, beloved, now are we the son, now are we now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. And I stopped right there. I thought, boy, am I glad of that. But I love the buts, you know. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And I, I thought about that, and I pondered that, and I, I thought, Lord, uh, do you really mean that? that I'm going to be like you. Do you really need that? And I thought about that, and I thought, and bro what Brother Seth has said today a couple times has really ministered to me. I know it's true, Lord. Help me to believe it. Yes. Help me to believe it. And as I contemplated that, I, I thought, I started thinking about what he was. I couldn't find one bad thing to think about the Savior, not one single bad thing. Everything was high and lofty and holy and just and good and pure and righteous and, and patient and long-suffering and merciful and, and just everything that I want to be, everything that I want to be. And I never seemed to be able to get to that plateau. But it's everything I want to be. So I read it again. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And I thought, I, and it just burst on me. I'm going to be like him. That's what he said. That's what he said. And I thought, well, I don't think it's a typo. I, I, I think he really means that. I'm going to be like him. And then I began to think, of course, back down to the earth again. Lord, how can that be? How can I possibly, possibly be like you? And you know, when he comes, and he is going to come, I'm going to be like him because he laid down his life on a ransom. He paid the debt for everything I couldn't accomplish and for everything I couldn't be here and for everything that I was before I ever knew him, he paid the debt. And when he comes, he's coming without sin. He's coming without all the imperfection. He's coming. And when he does, we will hear, thou good and faithful servant, even though now sometimes we don't feel like a good and faithful servant, when he comes, we, we certainly will. He certainly will be able to say that to us. 
But I love first and second and third John. I love all of these words, but first and second and third John. I thought about that and I thought, Lord, I want to grow up. I want to be an adult in wisdom, in knowledge, in understanding. I want to be able to stand strong for you. But I hope I never, ever grow out of childhood when it comes to malice and love. I want to stay a child. And I want to be a dear child. You know, I think it was Brother Seth that said, when you have children and some of them are, they are easier to obey than others, you know. Yeah. Well, God has those kind of children too, I think, you know. Yes. And sometimes he has to be a little more severe with some than others. Well, see, I don't want to be that kind of child. I want to be a dear child. Amen. There's, it's, it's so much easier to love a dear child. I want to be a dear child. Amen. 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 I love the account of Isaac and Rebecca and Eliezer, and I just want to just give you some of my view of it. In verse 22 of Gen Genesis chapter 24, it says, And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight in gold, and he placed them on her. And uh, he met the family, and later uh, he's explaining everything that his master owns, and he says, the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And in other words, he's saying to them, you see these things I put on her? Well, there's a lot more where that came from. Amen. Now, uh, Amen. When, I, when I think about heaven and I think about the things we experience now, there are those few moments here where we have pleasure that... Uh, is so great we forget our trial. There are moments where we have peace that is just all-encompassing and I think there's more where that came from. And there are moments of great joy and we know that there's more where that came from. And we have times where we feel very secure here. We have times uh, where we experience great love, times when we see great beauty, things that God has created, but we know there is so much more where that came from. He can only give us the first fruits now. And uh, when, we, when we see holiness, when we see purity, when we get a glimpse of God, there's so much more where that came from. So I think that God asks us, much as Rebecca was asked, it says, And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebecca and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. Amen. 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 I'd like to share just one statement that last night Brother Fred Buckley ministered to me about. He said simply, uh, that yes, the, this order has already passed away in my heart. By faith, he said, it's already passed away. Amen. That is, when God promises something by its words, it's good as done, even though it hasn't come about. And so by faith, in, in, in your heart, you can, you can say it's already gone, so when it actually does, then then we can be glad about it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> 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 That, that brings up a question that was asked to me by Brother Given. <laughs> I'm, I'm Chuck Marion from Wabash, Indiana. But uh, he asked me one time, way back when I first was going to church there, that uh, he said, come up to me and says, what time is it? And I looked at my watch, told him what time is it. No, no, no. High time to wake out of sleep. That's what time it is. <laughs> and so we, we see this in, in Revelation. But uh, the second coming, you think, you, you, you look at Revelation then. You know, and Revelation is a mystery, but that mystery is opened up to the, the saints of God. I mean, God opens that up to us. But yet, the other people, when you say Revelation, they say, stay away from that. I don't know anything about it, so they'll stay away from it. 
And I thank the Lord, Lord that uh, he has opened up this, enlightened our, our minds on this uh, revelation. But uh, when I see that, you know, the first thing I think of, overcome. You know, and so I, I wanted to go a little bit over those overcomes. And, uh, you know, because uh, well, I hear in, we're, behold, I come quickly, hold fast thou uh, what thou hast, and no man, that no man take your crown. So, Amen. then we, we start, I wanted to start into some of those. To him that overcome will I give to eat of the tree of life. See, now we, we've seen there in the beginning, you know, in the Garden of Eden. Now at the end, we can eat of the tree of life, if we overcome. It says, uh, he that overcomes shall not hurt, be hurt of the second death. Yes, amen. And eternal life with, with Christ, our brother. Oh, here it is. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Yeah. And even manna from the old times. So we got manna from the future yeah. that we have to look forward to. And he that overcometh keepeth my word uh, works unto the end. To him I will give power over the nations. Yeah. And uh, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Yeah. Amen. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my father in my with my father's uh, in, his. in his throne. Thank you. And I want uh, one more here in Revelation 21. Say, so he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Yeah. And we see these rewards that Maddie was talking about. Amen. If we overcome, Amen. we shall. You know, also, you know, being a, have a crown. You talked at the beginning about having a crown. We see those four and twenty elders. Yeah. They cast those crowns. Yeah. at the throne. Amen. 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 See, I have the advantage of knowing these people that have been, been talking, and I know some of the furnaces and floods they've been through. <laughs> you couldn't, if I told you, you wouldn't believe. You wouldn't believe what some of these people have been that You just heard talking. When the smell of smoke's not on their clothes. Not on. Joseph, you know, was a favorite of his father. Yet uh, Joseph was separated from his father for quite quite a long time. He was he's really alive and well. His, his father didn't he didn't know it. And uh, finally, at the sequence of events, he went down uh, to Egypt when he was about seventeen. In his early thirties, he finally word got back to Jacob. And Joseph sent his brothers back to tell Dell, Dad, I'm all right. And yeah, tell me, I want him to come with me. We want to be together now. There's a little verse, if I can read this, couched here in Genesis 45 that depicts what, declaring the coming of the Lord and the great rewards that are ahead that sort of portrays what it does. It says, and they told him, Jacob. First of all, they told him, saying, Joseph's yet alive. And he's governor over the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when, he's, when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're doing. We're showing you the wagons. <laughs> We're showing you the wagons. And when you see the wagon, your spirit, your spirit can be revived. Praise the Lord.
what is the returning of Christ means to me? Everything. <clears throat> Looking forward to him coming. And then Brother Aaron, uh, uh, spoke of a, read a scripture, my, one of my favorites, who brought me comfort from it. And in Hebrew, it where uh, Moses says, uh, he is esteeming the approach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had re re uh, respect unto the recompense of the reward. And the thing about Christ coming, uh, <clears throat> his precious, uh, his precious, uh, great riches, his precious gifts that God's given us. Um, Peter spoke about the uh, precious blood of the Lamb, the blood of Christ. These are very precious. Redeem us from our sins. Says, for, for as much you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things. And uh, remind me of a uh, Luke 18. It says, <clears throat> And the Lord spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like this text. It says, For there was in a city a judge who feared not God neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said unto him, with him himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the young judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect? Yes. When they cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I, and I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, <clears throat> shall he find faith on the earth. Mm. When the Lord said, hear what the unjudge saith, he said, uh, the unjudge says, I will avenge her, because he, she kept pestering him. Mm -hmm. And he was upset, it troubled him. That's the only reason why, she, lest he continue to come weary. He, wor he worried her, the judge, the unjudged judge, but not when you come to the Lord. Yes. When you come to the Lord, he wants us to come to him. We cried to him day and night for our help and our need, and it not, does not worry him. He, he, he with open arms, <laughs> and, even, and, he's, and even thinking at that this, this time, it says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, we find faith in the earth. Well, I want to have him find faith in me. Amen. And I hold these, these are real precious, great riches of Christ. His precious blood. He died for me. He, I love him because he first loved me. And they're, they're precious gifts. Gift, the trials of our faith that uh, they mentioned before. They're more precious than gold. Mm -hmm. See? <clears throat> That's the earth. It's uh, a reproach to uh, it's a re uh, to the earth, to the earth, it's a reproach of uh, the great riches of Christ. It's a reproach, isn't it not? Mm -hmm. But these treasures, I thought, of this, of him coming for us. Uh, I'm kind of clumsily trying to say this, but I'm anticipating his coming. And uh, when Brother Michael talked about the, uh, the angels coming, the reapers, that puts a, a fear of God in me too, the fear of uh, I don't want to be left out. Mm -hmm. So I think for, uh, uh, for by, it says, for by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. See, the great gift of God, he's he given us the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen.
he that hath this hope purifieth himself. <clears throat> you know, there's a, there's a lot of scoffers that walk around saying that where is the promise of his coming? All things continue as they have since the fathers have fell asleep. When you think about those saints and ages past after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and now this is the way the carnal man the carnal mind reasons that they weren't too bright were they 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 were so silly they thought the Lord might even I mean they really thought the Lord would come in their lifetime <clears throat> now were they wrong no they weren't wrong that's that's exactly the ministry that this truth is supposed to have. It's not like trickery or something. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit concerning our expectation of the coming of the Lord. Amen. And he that hath this hope purifieth himself. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I might share personal testimony as it relates to what Brother Mike just said. Um, since the uh, late 30s, uh, I had the return of Christ installed in my heart and mind on a weekly basis. I was fortunate in that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It was uh, stressed on a weekly basis. I've always believed that the Lord was going to return. Now, I had the unfortunate experience, though, of saying that uh, my relationship to his return was based on law. And that did not make his return very good. I didn't have a happy childhood in that regard. Now, our basis of our salvation was uh, supposed to be on law. Of course, uh, as the years ensued, and the grace of God dawned upon my heart and mind and I accepted that and saw his grace. Um, it made the return of Jesus much more palatable to my mind. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, it made it even more palatable when I found out that, you know, we used to ask the question, what have you done for me lately? Jesus can answer that question. <laughs> he is there on the throne ministering grace. The heavens are open. Mm. He's been raised us up to sit with him in heavenly places so he can minister help in time of need. Amen. So as I avail myself of his high priestly duties, then his return becomes uh, even more anticipated eager. Now on the opposite side, I feel myself in the last few years more and more ill-equipped to deal with this world. Um, I was uh, fortunate in that I was able to go to school and uh, learn a trade and get a couple of degrees and even teach school and, you know, go in business and from the world's per perspective uh, gain a, a little bit of success from the world's perspective maybe even a great deal of success. But is that progressed, I felt more and more uncomfortable with the whole situation. Uh, I felt more and more comfortable in the Lord, but more and more uncomfortable in Adam. Mm -hmm. So you, your joy, my joy, that people thought I should have in Adam, they couldn't understand why a man as uh, successful as I was was out picking up iron and in greasy clothes and mowing my own yard and things like that. You know, I, they thought surely my joy could come from something else. There is no joy in anything but being in the Lord. So as I become more and more anticipating his return and finding great joy in that, mm -hmm. uh, I'm more and more ill, uh, comfortable in this world. Amen. So there's been two effects on the return of the Lord. The first effect was not good because my relationship to him was based on law. The second effect has been uh, very joyful even though as Adam continues to die in me, 
uh, I've become very uh, unpleased with this work. Mm -hmm. Amen. For those of you who don't know, I'm Brother Aaron's wife, Barbara Hutchcraft. Um, I was just thinking uh, since we began, I think Brother Seth said something that just triggered my memory to Romans, where it talks about um, the people who don't honor God and give thanks to Him, but He makes sure that they believe a lie. And in my opinion, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking of all the people, oh, you know, He won't come in my lifetime, I want to have a family, I want to, you know, all this stuff that they put off his return. And I believe that the Lord has made sure that they believe a lie because of the fact that they don't honor him and they don't give thanks to him. I don't want to be in that position. I want to be in a position to give thanks to him. And uh, as John did in Revelation, you know, amen, come quickly. And because I know what he says is going to come to pass. Amen, amen. Anyone else had anything they would like to share with us before we close? If not, then it's uh, just about five o'clock. Would you stand with me for a word of prayer? 